I want to thank you, my lovely wife and I, Reverend Stacy Bell. We want to thank you for uh, coming on live with us. And if you're not able to come on live, we thank you for watching uh, this as an archive as well uh, or watching it at on StreamSpot, uh, Roku at StreamSpot or on uh, my YouTube channel, uh, Dr. Randy Bell Sr. So I hope you had a great Wednesday. Uh, I pray all is going well with you. We're going to go ahead and open up with prayer and we're going to get right into our lesson. So, Father, we just come into your presence by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just want to say thank you. You are great. And there is no God like you. You are awesome in all your ways. And we just uh, appreciate you. And we just thank you. Father, we just plead the blood of Jesus over our lives. Uh, I plead the blood of Jesus over our lives and over all that you have blessed us with. And over all that you have made us stewards over. I plead the blood of Jesus over the portals of our minds, our bodies, which are temples of the Holy Spirit. Our intellect, our emotions, and our wills. And Father, I believe that we're protected by the blood of the Lamb, which gives us access to the Holy of Holies. Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over our homes, over our vehicles, over our work, over our finances, our marriages, our relationships. I plead the blood of Jesus over our ministries, dear Lord. Father, you said that the life of the flesh is in the blood, and therefore I thank you for that blood which has uh, cleansed us from sin and sealed the new uh, covenant in which we are partakers of. Father, in the name of Jesus, we call on you in accordance to 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Father, the prayer uh, that Jabez made, we pray the same thing. We ask that you would bless us indeed, dear Lord God, and enlarge our territories. We pray that your hand will be with us and that you will keep us from evil and that we may not cause any pain. And Father, we thank you for granting our request just as you did for Jabez. And Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, Father. We bind our minds to the mind uh, and, the, and to your will. We bind our minds to the will of God in Jesus' name. Father, we just thank you in accordance to Romans chapter 12 for the mercies by which you allow us to present our bodies as living sacrifices to you holy and, and acceptable, which is our spiritual service, our reasonable service and worship to you. Dear Lord, it is not our will to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove that good, acceptable, and perfect will uh, that you have for us. By the grace that is given to us to show us how not to esteem ourselves more or less important to the body of Christ and others. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the spiritual gifts that have been given to us that we may prophesy in proportion to our faith and that we may teach according to <clears throat> your precious word and to exhort and to give liberty, liberally and lead with diligence and show mercy with cheerfulness. O oh Lord, show us how, to, how our love can be without hypocrisy. We choose to walk in love and not allow our love to be hypocritical. Teach us to abhor what is evil and to cling to what is good. Teach us to be kind and affectionate to one another in honor and to give preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, but to be fervent in spirit to serve you, dear Lord. And Father, we rejoice in hope. We are patient through tribulation and we shall continue in distributing to the needs of the saints and be truly given to hospitality. Father, we will bless those who curse and persecute us. We will rejoice with those who rejoice with us. And we will weep with those who weep with us. Mm -hmm. We will be of the same mind toward one another. And not set our minds on high things. But associate ourselves with the humble. We will not be wise in our own opinions. And we will not repay anyone evil for evil. For your word says to repay evil with good. We will not give place to wrath, but we will wait on your vengeance, dear Lord. And we will live peaceably with all people and be overcomers through Christ Jesus. Lord, we will offer drink to a thirsty enemy and food to one that is hungry, that we may abide in your word forever, because we love you, Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. And Father, we just pray this prayer 
In Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Well, praise the Lord. Father, thank you. And I just need to also thank you, Father, for allowing me to teach to your precious and valuable people. To teach this message so that people can be free. <clears throat> so that people can be free and they can live uh, to their potential. Uh, the same goes for me as well. So thank you, Father. Uh, we ble and we bless you in mm -hmm. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you are ready. Check it out, y'all. 82nd Airborne. That's me. Used to be me. Paratrooper. All the way. Double A. I got some coffee tonight. A lovely wife. She can make some coffee. All right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Having a little fun here. You gotta have fun. That's what my wife tells me. Mm -hmm. You gotta have fun in life. So we can have fun and study the Word of God. That's right. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Deuteronomy. Let's go all the way over to Deuteronomy chapter 30. And let's look at verse 19. Let's look at verses 19 and 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verses 19 and 20. And thank you for joining us. I want to give a shout out to uh, to the Free Gospel Church of God in Christ, the church that we attend. And the pastor there is, a, uh, is an honorable man of God. His name is Pastor John Grant. And sir, we salute you and God bless you, sir. And we thank you for being on uh, the telecast. So it says here, I call heaven and earth to witness this day against you. That I have set before you life and death, the blessings and the curses. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live and may love the Lord your God, obey his voice and cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So. We're continuing our teaching today on the causes for curses. There is a reason why you could be under a curse. Now, many of you might say, but I am blessed. Well, uh, you are blessed in accordance to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. In fact, let's go over there. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. It says here in the Amplified, Christ purchased our freedom, redeeming us from the curse, the doom of the law, and its condemnation by himself becoming a curse for us. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree or is crucified. Let's go over to verse 29, the last verse in Galatians 3. And it says, and if you belong to Christ, are in him who is Abraham's seed, then you are Abraham's offspring and spiritual heirs according to promise. So we see that. So, you know, we hear, I've, I've heard people say, but I'm blessed, so there can't be no curse. But God, but Jesus purchased, uh, he became a curse for us so that we did not have to be a curse. So basically what I'm saying is, is just because Christ delivered or, or became a curse for us so that we can be blessed, you could still be living on the earth and not be uh, living in those blessings. And if you're not living in those blessings, if there's a consistent pattern of you not living in, in the blessings of God, then then you have to understand that there could be some type of curse going on in your life that you have to uh, that you have to to uh, to uh, dispel so that you can enjoy the blessings. So, you know, some people get offended, but the bottom line is if I asked you uh, if you're blessed, are you uh, are, are you broke? And if you say you're broke and you're always broke and you can't ever seem to make money or you're always sick and you're always in accidents. I mean, don't you know that there could be something on you? So um, uh, so you could be blessed and, and, and you could be redeemed for the curse from the curse and the enemy could still try to rob you of your blessings. So what you have to do is. You just simply have to re or you have to enforce what belongs to you. It's just like a homeowner. A homeowner owns a 
a, a property and if a squatter comes on, the squatter has no rights but can still be living in your home. And what do you have to do to 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 uh, to exercise your right of home ownership? You have to get it enforced through the court. Yes, yeah, your house. But now you need extra help in getting rid of the squatter. So for us, that extra help is the word of God and the knowledge of the word of God. Because, look, Abraham was blessed. His seed was blessed. So understand, even though his seed was blessed, they went into captivity because of idolatry. So they were blessed, too. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Well, they're blessed. Why are they in captivity? Well, they did something to invite the wrath of God, to invite demonic uh, uh, demonization uh, or, or oppression to, to come into their lives. And they were worshiping idols. They were worshiping idols. It's just that simple. So for those that believe that you're because you're saved, you are free from curses, you know, um, Walking in ignorance is one of the greatest tools for the enemy. When we walk in ignorance, we fuel the enemy and we let the enemy know it's okay to continue to do what you're doing in our lives. Now, let's look at, let's go to the book of Lamentations. Let's go to Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 5. Lamentations chapter 5. I like for us to look at verse 7. Lamentations chapter 5, verse 7 says this Our fathers sinned and are no more, and we have borne their iniquities. So let's look at this again. It says, Our fathers sinned and are no more. So what does that mean? Well, that means that this is Israel, people of Israel talking. They said, Hey, our fathers were in idolatry and were sinning against the Lord and they are no more, meaning now they're dead. They're no longer physically or spiritually on the earth. They are no longer on the earth. Now look what it says here at the end. And we have borne their iniquities. Now, again, what is an iniquity? An iniquity is a sin that becomes pleasurable to an individual see at first it just starts out as a sin a trespass but then when you engage in it through the fact uh, 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 repetitively and it doesn't seem like sin anymore now that sin becomes an iniquity and whenever there's an iniquity demonic forces now have a legal right to come in and the Bible makes it very clear that iniquity gets visited to the uh, third. It gets visited to the next generation all the way to the fourth generation. So it says here, our fathers have sinned and are no more. They're not they're 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 gone. They're no longer on the earth. And we have borne their iniquities. So sins get passed down. I mean, that's obvious. Adam sinned, right? Don't we sin? Why do we sin? Because we came from Adam. So we're inclined to sin. So, you know, I don't understand why people don't understand that. Adam sinned, and when you are born, you are born in sin. That pretty little baby that you gave birth to, he or she is a sinner. You may love them, and you do love them, and you're going to give them a chance to get saved. But they're a sinner. It's just as simple as that. They're cute and adorable, but they're sinners. We're born into sin. All of us are born into sin. So if sin can be passed down from Adam, well, guess what? Sin can be passed down from your father. Because Adam is our first father. Abraham was our father and he sinned. So, so, so sins pass through bloodlines. I just want you to understand that. Let's look at, we're going to look at a couple more scriptures. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 and, and 2. It says here, the word of the Lord came to me again saying, verse 2, What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes 
and the children's teeth are set on edge. What does that mean? That means here, God is saying that the children of Israel are in captivity. They're in captivity today or at that time because of what their fathers and forefathers were doing. And what were they doing? They were in idol worship. So it says here, the fathers have eaten sour grapes. They have sinned because sour grapes are useless. They offer no value to a person. So they engaged in sinful behavior. And it says here they enjoyed they enjoyed the pleasures of those sour grapes. They enjoyed the sugar and the sweetness that came from those sour grapes. They enjoyed all of it. And then it says here, and the children's teeth are set on edge. So the fathers were eating the sour grapes, which are no value, but they do have some sweetness. But the children's teeth are rotten because of what the fathers ate. Mm -hmm. So do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. how, how this is very, very important for our lives and the lives of those that come after us. That we understand uh, as believers that curses do exist and how they can come and how to avoid them. And so that's why I'm dedicating a lot of time to teaching this and moving very slowly because I want you to understand if you are watching this and you're a minister, I want you to go teach this to people because people need to hear this. Too many of our people are broke, busted and disgusted, always sick, always losing Always not getting ahead in life. Now, you can't tell me you blessed and you're not getting ahead in life. That means something is wrong. Many of us are not realizing our full potential in life. Some of us are being short-circuited. And I know what I'm talking about. Because our years have been taken away due to things like this. Because of a lack of knowledge. And look, I want you to go back and God wants you to go back and restore your youth. And get back on the path that you're supposed to be on. So that you can be the winner that you are right now. That you have always been. Mm -hmm. You have always been a winner. You have always been a, a warrior who overcomes. You've always been that. But you may be, you may have been hindered because of some of the things that your folks have been doing in the past. So I wanted you to see that. Now let's go over to, where do I want to go? Uh, I want to go to Proverbs chapter 26. Let's go to Proverbs 26. Let me turn there. Appreciate you waiting for me. Now, it says here in verse 2, it says, Like a sparrow in her wandering, like the swallow in her flying, so the causeless curse does not come or alight. It does not come. Now, the Bible here is referencing curses or how curses come to the behavior of a bird. So a bird flies. How does a bird wander? A, a bird wanders by flying. A bird doesn't wander by walking on the ground. It can get killed. It flies. Is looking for food. Is looking for food like the swallow in her flying. Okay, a, a swallow is a type of bird. So a bird is looking for a reason to come onto the earth. Whoa. The bird is looking for a reason to come onto the earth. The invitation for the bird to come onto the earth is food. It's food. If the bird sees a worm, the bird now has a reason to come to the earth to get the worm or to get the food, whatever it may be, bread or whatever it may be. So the bird is wandering and looking for a reason to touch down onto the earth. If there is no food available, the earth, I mean, on the earth. The bird has no reason to, to, to come to the earth, to come onto the physical ground. So the same thing with a curse. A curse is going through the air. 
is going through the first and the second heaven where the enemy dwells. Please understand, Satan does not dwell underground. The Bible in the book of Ephesians makes it very clear that he's the prince of the power of the air. All right, so he he's in control of the airwaves. That's why you see so much ridiculous stuff on TV. That's why pornography is, is, is rampant. That's why access to filth and junk is so easy. Why? Because it is being it is being ran by who the, the one who lives in the first and second heaven, which is Satan. Satan doesn't live in the third heaven. That's where God dwells. Sin went all the way from the earth all the way to the second heaven, but it stopped at the doorstep at the third heaven. So having said that, a curse is 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 wallowing around. And it's looking for a reason to come into your life. So when you and I sin, a curse says, oh, I got a reason to come. I got a reason to, to uh, I got a reason to come into your life. I got a reason to come in. I got an invitation. See, a roach doesn't come into your house unless it's looking for food or water. If you leave trash, you got that's an automatic invitation for bugs and rodents to come to your house. It's an automatic invitation. If there are no bugs and you keep the house clean. Now sometimes some roaches will come looking for water. Even if your house is clean. But for the majority of the time they will not come. Ants will not come if they don't see food. Ants will not come into your house unless they see food. If you leave food on your countertops. You, 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 and you see ants and you get upset. You can't get upset at the ant. You have to get upset at yourself because you gave them an invitation to come into your home. So through ignorance, through darkness, through sin, through enjoying sin, not repenting of sin, through the behavior of our forefathers, sin says, I got a reason to come because your father was in adultery. I got a reason to come. And guess what? I'm going to try to get you in adultery. Or I'm going to try to get your your daughter or your, your son into adultery. Do you see what I'm saying? So it has a reason now. And so you have to break the cause for the curse so that the curse can go elsewhere. Everybody got me. So I want you to understand that. So... You cannot say, I don't understand why all this is going on. I, you know, your life is a wreck. You know, you losing everything. Now, look, there are sometimes the enemy can come, will come and try to do some things in your life. I'm not talking about things that happen sporadically. Like uh, you might just you, you lose your job and there's no fault of your own. That's not a curse. That's just that's just stuff that happens. But I'm talking about you didn't lost the last five jobs because you can't act right. You know, or you keep going to prison. That's a problem or you can't stop drinking or you can't stop sleeping around or you can't stop robbing people. That's that's a that that is different. That's now you have to look and say, man, you know, my life is all messed up because of what I'm doing. Because there's something on my life or you might say, look, I'm a I'm a, I'm a believer and I shouldn't be going through what's going on. And then you and then the Lord says, you know, or you hear a teaching by me or somebody else to talk about generational curses and you find that. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. My father practiced. My grandfather practiced voodoo. Or I got uncles and cousins and stuff like that older than me that were practicing Freemasonry and they had made oaths. And now Satan wants payment and they're gone. But I'm now I'm now have to uh, have to have to pay for the stuff that they did. That, that means you have to get that off you so that the blessings can continue to flow into your life uh, without being hindered and, with not, and, and without coming sporadically in your life. So having said that, I've been talking about, I started last week talking about reasons why uh, curses can come into your life. And I think I gave, I think I gave like eight points. And so we're going to pick up. At number nine. Yeah. The first point I gave was idolatry. Let me tell you something. Idolatry. God hates idolatry. You know what? God says, you know what, Satan? Don't worry about this one. I hate this so much. I'm going to take care of this one. Because God says, you know, what? I will visit your iniquity to the third and fourth generation. God hates idolatry so much 
And he says, I will handle that. He don't even send Satan for that one. He says, Satan, you just, you just, you chill on this one. I got this one because I hate it so much. And he's the one in Exodus chapter 20 says that I will visit your iniquity all the way down to your great, great, great grandchildren. That's what he said. So I didn't say that. God said that. Exodus chapter 20. Check it out. Number two, dishonoring your parents. If you dishonor your parents, you can expect to live under a curse. You can expect never to live up to your full potential. You can have all the degrees in the world, but you'll never, ever measure up to what God has for you in life. Look, whether your parents are dead or alive, get it right in the name of Jesus. Repent. The Bible makes it clear. It does not matter whether your parents were good, bad, right, wrong, wealthy, broke, loved you, did not love you, perfect or very imperfect. Does not matter. None of those things matter at all. Whether they were wise or foolish. None of that matters at all. God says you are to honor your parents. Let me tell you something. Because when you obey your parents, you are obeying the Lord. So please understand that. Your parents are the highest authority in your life besides God. And when you dishonor them, it is the same thing as dishonoring God himself. Now, you may not like your parents, but God put those two people, that man and that woman together to bring you into the earth because he had a purpose for you. So if nothing else, you honor them because they brought you into the world. You know, I love my mother-in-law because my mother-in-law gave birth to my lovely wife. I thank her so much. I love that woman so much for the simple fact is that she birthed my, my wife. She brought my wife onto the earth. So I'm so grateful. And so, look, honoring your parents, that don't mean just your birth parents. That means your step parents, too. I don't like my step parents, but if they had a hand in raising you, you're supposed to honor them, too. Adoptive parents. If your parents adopted you, you ought, you ought to honor them. Mm -hmm. You are to honor them because they did not have to select you. Mm -hmm. So you are to honor them. So uh, uh, foster parents, you are to honor them. You are to honor them. Birth parents, step parents, adoptive parents, foster parents, any other kind of parent. If an aunt took you in and raised you as your child, honor her. So there is no excuse. So many people honor their mothers and they don't honor their fathers and they don't understand the blessing comes from the father. Mm. And you may say, but if my father gets on my nerves, so what? He's the one that has the blessing. Mm. He's the one that has the blessing. And if he doesn't put that blessing on you, you're not blessed. The blessing, the highest blessing on the earth, aside from God, is the, is the blessing of the father. Is the blessing of the father. So for those of you that don't that ignore your fathers and stuff like that, I'm gonna tell you something. Don't do it. Hey, if you hey, at least call them and say, hey, I love you and I appreciate you. Or something. Do something. It doesn't matter what they've done. Honor them. Amen? Amen. Now the next part is disrespecting people's property, removing landmarks. Look, leave people's property alone. When you mess with people's property, and you know, it's just like it is it's dishonoring to God. Because that, that is their lot in life that God has blessed them with. When you remove plots at a cemetery, look, all stuff like that, when you, uh, landmarks are against the law, even in the natural. So it's, 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 it's a, God does not honor people that disrespect people's property. Stop walking on people's yards without their permission. Stop ingressing on them. They may be offended by that. And if they're offended by that, then you're caught in sin. So leave that alone. Being unkind to the disabled. The Bible says unkind to the blind. Number four. When you're unkind to disabled people. People that can't fend for themselves. Look. Expect a curse to come into your life. Number five. Distorting justice. When you say good is evil and good and evil is good. Then you know what? The Bible makes it clear in Proverbs 17, 13. Whoever rewards evil for good. Evil shall not depart from his house. So be very careful. Number six, sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is different than all other sins because you actually sin inside of your body. Your soul actually becomes 
uh, uh, confused and it becomes aggravated and the soul is not right when you commit sexual sin. That includes fornication. So all you save people sleeping around, let me just tell you, you're wrong. And you can expect God to uh, or you can expect demonic activity to come into your life if you if you engage in that behavior and you won't stop that. I know what TV does. I know how some TV shows make it seem like it's OK, but it's against God's law. Adultery. Adultery will wreck your marriage and you can lose the respect of those that love you and those that are close to you. Look, this also consists with uh, this also includes incest. Uh, of sexual intercourse with family members. And look, this also includes stepchildren, step parents, step relatives, and adoptive relatives, all that stuff. All that stuff is included. All that stuff is abominable to God. Masturbation, uh, pornography, these things God does not like, and also an unclean thought life. Number seven, secretly smiting your neighbor. This includes gossip and slander. Your neighbor is everyone you come in contact with or that you cross paths with. Number eight, killing an innocent person. If you kill an innocent person without cause, your uh, that blood has to be accounted for. And if you don't pay for it, someone in your bloodline will pay for it. Uh, so that was it. Number nine. Let's pick up here at number nine. Number nine. And we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 17. Number nine. What can uh, another cause for a curse? The ninth cause for a curse is trusting in man. Trusting in man. I'll say it again. Trusting in man. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 17 verses five and six. I'm going to read it and amplify. Thus says the Lord. Curse. With great evil is the strong man who trusts in and relies on frail man, making weak human flesh his arm, and whose mind and heart turn aside from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub or a person naked and destitute in the desert, and he shall not see any good come, but shall dwell in the parched places in the wilderness in an uninhabitable salt land. And then let's go over to the book of Psalms, Psalm 146, Psalm 146. Let's go over there, please. Let's look at verses three through five, Psalm 146, verses three through five. The word here says, um, <clears throat> put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no help. When his breath leaves him. He returns to his earth in that very day. His previous thoughts, plans and purposes perishes. They go away with him. God says, look, do not trust man. Don't put your trust in man. Now you might say, yeah, but I follow my pastor. You shouldn't even trust your pastor. What you do is you follow his or her faith. You follow their model of living if they're living for God. So now you're serving God as he serves God or she serves God and you're modeling your service after his service. There's nothing wrong with that. But when I'm talking about trusting in man is when you're putting your life in the hands of another man. Your life belongs to you and you should consult God almighty and find out what he says. Now, God may say, I want you to go talk to this person, but let it come from God. Don't run to man. So many people get in trouble and they run to man first with their problems, looking for validation and looking for answers when they don't know either because they have their own problems. God says, look, come seek me first. Look, you uh, and, and this is what was happening with Israel. Israel was hiring soldiers from Egypt and other areas to come help them against Babylon and against Assyria. And God says, you can hire them all you want. They're going to get killed, too, just along with you. And you're still going to get and, and the rest of you are still going to go into captivity. And that's what happened. And so he says, look, you, you, you're consulting all this. You have all these hired people thinking that they can beat these people. No, because, look, my purpose will go. Uh, it, it will go forth as I as I said, it's going to go. So, you know, trusting in man. Look, stop trusting in your job. Your job could go away tomorrow. And I know what I'm talking about because I had an excellent job 
and it was taken right up under me and didn't didn't realize it. And, and you know, it hurt. But stop trusting in your paycheck. Start trusting in God. Start believing God. Let God lead your life, lead your life. Let him lead it. Make sure it's him leading it and not your own flesh. I made that mistake before, too. Don't do that. Make sure it's God. Make sure it's God. Because God will put you on a, a on an adventure. And you'll love it. But stop trusting in your paycheck. Stop buying up stuff all the time and getting in debt uh, because you're buying things that you think will satisfy you. Because what if God needs you to move? Mm. You can't move because you didn't spent up all your money. All your money is 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 owed to everybody else come come payday. Don't don't do that. Don't do that. Don't trust in man. Don't trust in man. Trust in in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. Let God let God um let God um set your path and lead you. Let him lead you. He will lead you if you allow him. So don't put your trust in princes. Look, people put too much trust in in in, in, in our leaders. Stop putting your trust in the president. The presidents let me tell you something. <laughs> Presidents, they all say the same thing and they all fail. They all promise you a job and security. And they can't do that. And peace from your enemies. And they can't really fully do that. They can't. They can't. Every president, every president that I can think of all the way down to George Washington, to the first president, they have not been able to bring security to a whole nation. You want to know why? They're not God. God is God. He's a king. And as a king, he has to provide for his subjects. But when the subjects are trusted in man, he doesn't have to provide for them. Mm. So stop relying on people. Mm. Trust God. Stop relying on your job. Go to work. Don't quit. Go to work. Earn your pay. And find out what God wants you to do with it. Be responsible and all that other stuff. But stop trusting in your job. All right? You're, you're more than what your job is. And I had to learn that. I learned that. You're more than what your job is. All right? Way more. And you know what? If you trust God, God will show you. And, and, and you may be even, and, and, and if you follow him, you can walk in more than, than what your job has to offer. Because your job is simply enough for you to get by. It's not enough for you to have life and have it abundantly. Employers don't believe in that. They want to have life and have it more abundantly. Those who work for them, you know, they don't have that. They work so that they can have that. So don't trust in man. Number 10, this also can bring on a curse. Neglecting the poor. Neglecting the poor. Neglecting the poor. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 27 he who gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes from their want will have many a curse. It just says that right there. One thing I respect from our pastor is that he feeds the poor twice a week. And you know what? God sees that. And uh, uh, the free gospel will never be in want and he'll never be in want. Because the Bible makes it clear also in, in Psalms that when you lend, that when you um, feed the poor, God says you're lending to him and God will always pay back. And we know how God is. He pays back extravagantly. So also, let's look at Psalm chapter 41, Psalm 41, verses one, two and three. Psalm 41, it says here. In the Amplified, it says, blessed, see, listen to that, blessed, happy, fortunate, to be envied, is he who considers the weak and the poor. See, it says here, the one who hides his eyes, in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 27, from the poor will have many a curse. Psalm 41 says, blessed, happy, Fortunate to be envied is the person who considers the weak and the poor. The Lord will deliver him in the time of evil and trouble. The Lord will protect him and keep him alive. 
He shall be called blessed in the land and you will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will sustain, refresh and strengthen him on his bed of languishing. All his bed, you, O Lord, will turn, change and transform in his illness. That means you, you'll be made you if you're sick. If you're sick, if you're on a bed of sickness, God says you're going to be well. And see, this is a law. Please understand, this is a law. Let me tell you something. A law can be exercised by a saved or unsaved person. And, and both will reap the benefits. Because I know some of you wonder, well, how can this unsaved person be so wealthy and always healed? Smoking liquor and uh, I mean smoking on uh, cigars and drinking liquor. I don't do any of that, and I'm always sick. Yeah, but he's always giving to the poor, and you always keep your, keeping your money in your pocket with your stingy self. God says, you know what? What's going to happen is when he's on his bed because he did not violate this law. I have to bless him. So please understand. So many people believe that just because you're saved, you just you're automatically blessed. No, you're blessed when you exercise God's laws. And this is a law. This is a law. You will be blessed when you consider the poor. And look, it doesn't matter. And I had to learn this and I felt really bad. And I had to repent to God several weeks ago. Because we, you know, you know, you know, we've been taught. Well, that person is not saved. Don't give to saved people. You won't be blessed. Well, Jesus healed people that weren't saved. Jesus restored people that weren't saved. So who are we to to, to say? Well, we we I'm only going to give to someone that's saved. So that's 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 saved. No, that's out of order. It's not right. And I had to repent on that. And you know, because when people come to me. Say, can I have some money and stuff? And sometimes I'll get I'll get a little angry, you know. And so I, I you know, God, He showed me, said, uh-uh, remember this law. So I, I was in downtown Atlanta, I had to stop to get some gas, which is not a good idea, uh, to stop in downtown Atlanta to get gas. <laughs> but I had to stop right on the edge of downtown, the southern edge, right before I 20 off uh Prior Street. And so I had to go get some gas. And it's uh and and I went I was in the hood y'all which don't matter don't 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 phase me because I grew up in the hood but I was there and I had to get some gas in order to get through downtown and to get to the uh, and, and to get to the northern suburb of, of Marietta and so anyway and so I saw these these uh these poor people and this one and, and this one guy he said you know what he said sir I'm real hungry and. And my heart just leaped because it was my opportunity. I said, I'll be right back because I don't carry cash. And so I got something and I, uh, I I got some change and I put five dollars in that man's hands and his eyes welled up with water. And he thanked me. And I said, no problem. And I said, no problem, because I understand now what the law says. God says, when you look after poor people, when you look, you give them what you what you can give them. You give them what you can give them. That's what I had, and that's what I gave them. And 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 God showed me you exercised a law, and I want you to exercise it more. And so look, it doesn't matter if a person is poor or not poor. Now, of course, if if you know a person is swindling you and stuff like that, that's different. But look, we don't have, we're we're not to sit around and judge and ask them questions. If you can give to them, give to them. Be a blessing to somebody's life. Because that dollar may not be nothing to you, but that's a meal to someone else who haven't eaten in days. So it's a law. It's a law. When you exercise this law, God says, I'm going to make sure that when you're sick, you'll be healed. He said, I'm going to make sure that when, you're, um, when your enemies come against you, I'm going to come against your enemies. You don't have to worry about that. He said, look, when evil and trouble, evil times and troubled times come into your life, he says, look. I will deliver you from that. That is a law, dear brothers and sisters. Exercise that law. Don't neglect the, the poor. Anytime you have a chance to give to the poor, give to the poor. Okay? Number 11. Number 11. This will bring a curse to your life uh, if you, if you, if, if you uh, don't repent from this or if you play with this. Number 11 is anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, basically uh, cursing Jewish people, the mistreatment of Jewish people. 
God makes it clear in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. It says, and I will bless those who bless you. God is talking about Abraham and his posterity. He says, I will bless those who bless you, who confer prosperity or happiness upon you and curse him who curses or uses insolent language toward you. In you will all the families and kindred of the earth be blessed and by you they will bless themselves. So look, Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus was Jewish. And the Bible makes it very clear that when you talk against Jewish people, when you curse them, when you when you use insolent language toward them, then expect not to be blessed. And, you know, I think America has suffered a little bit by that, particularly from the uh, last administration and how uh, in this in this treatment of the prime minister of Israel several times. Look, that stuff can come back on you. And if a leader is practicing that, then everyone under his care will uh, will uh, will receive the 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 curses for that. So, look, don't mistreat uh, Jewish people. And I'm going to be honest with you. All these folks that are in uh, Israel's business, Israel has a right to build wherever the heck they want to build. They have every right to build on their land. That land belongs to them. God said it's their land and it's their land forever. It does not. It is not a Palestinian state. It is a nation and the land belongs to them. And so I'm just letting you know that's where I stand from that with that anti-Semitism. When you go against Jewish people, expect not to be blessed. Treat them with kindness. Genesis chapter 27 and verse 29 it says, let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brothers. Let your mother's sons bow down to you. Let everyone be cursed who curses you and favored with blessings who blesses you. All right. So look, walk in love with with God's people. And in fact, God makes it clear. It's in Psalm. I forgot where it's in Psalm. I want to say it's in Psalm 140 somewhere the 140s, but playing with God uh, uh, or messing with the Jewish people is just like taking your finger and putting it in God's eye. The Bible makes it very clear that the Jews are the apple of God's eye. He loves us too, us Gentiles, but he makes it clear that the Jews are the apple of God's eye. Number 12, this can invite a curse into your life. Very simple, disobedience to God's laws. And that's what I said earlier. God's laws will break you. I love what Pastor John Hagee you, uh, have said in the past. He said, you don't break the law. The law breaks you. And I wish I could coin that. I wish I said that first. But I totally agree. Laws break those who don't obey them. It's as simple as that. Laws break you and I, we don't break laws. When we when we disobey them, they turn around, they turn around and come against us. So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let's look at verse 15. It says here. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, mm. being watchful to do all his commandments. That we see a word all, y'all. You don't get to pick and choose what you want to do and what you don't want to do. All. All means all, and that's all all means. All his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And if you go from verse 16 all the way to verse 68 it lists nothing but curses now notice Deuteronomy 28 1 through 14 talks about blessings but fit but 16 all the way to 68 mention 
all the curses that will come because of not uh, because of being disobedient to God's laws. Look, God's laws are in place to bless us. But when we break them, they will bring a curse to us. Everybody got it. So let's look again. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Not again. But let's take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And let's look at verses 22 and 23. It says here, Samuel said, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Now, let me give you a little backdrop. The, the You know, here in chapter 15, God told King Saul to kill King Agag. All right. And to kill all the Amalekites. He said, kill everybody. He said, kill the, the, father, the men, the women, the children, the babies and the cattle. Now, some of you might say, well, that's harsh. God says, no, it's not harsh. This is their just due for their treatment of Israel when they were wandering in the land, when they were uh, in the wilderness. He says the sin has finally come up to him and it was payment time. He said, kill everybody. Saul did not kill everybody. Saul spared King Agag and the best of the sheep. And so Samuel is, is, is letting him know how angry God is at him. And so it says here, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice because Saul thought he was doing what's right. He was he was uh, he was sacrificing sheep. Samuel showed up. He heard sheep in the background. <laughs> he heard sheep. He's like, what's going on here? Saul talking about, hey, behold, I obeyed the Lord. And he said, well, why do I hear the bleeding of sheep? And he said, well, I saved the best so I can give an offering to God. So many of us think we can sin and then give an offering to God and that that offering is good enough. That offering is a stench in God's nostrils when you're in sin. You have to get the sin out of your life. Then he'll accept the offering. He doesn't accept the offering in exchange for the sin. You can't buy God off. God owns a cattle of a thousand hills. The silver and the gold belongs to the, to the Lord. So you can't buy him off. So he says, so it says here, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Guess what? If you obey, you don't have to sacrifice. Have you ever thought about that? If you obey, there's no need to sacrifice. There's no sacrifice to be had if you obey. See, most people sacrifice because they're trying to cover up or they're trying to get certain things expelled. All you have to do is ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus and obey him. So he says, he says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. God says, I don't want your fat offerings. I don't want the best of the sheep. I want your obedience first. God is saying, I don't want your service. I don't care about you coming to church five days a week. I don't care about that. You're still in sin. You need to fix that issue. Otherwise, you're not going to hear from me. Otherwise, my blessings will not flow into your life. You can go to church forever and you can still be in sin. It's the relationship. It's the obedience part that God wants. So he says, look, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Check that out. Rebellion is just like idolatry. Rebellion equals idolatry. You can write it on the board. Rebellion equals sign idolatry. Idolatry equals witchcraft. Witchcraft and idolatry is the same thing. And isn't that what the children, God had a problem with the children of Israel about? Had a problem with witchcraft. Had a problem with witchcraft. It says here, rebellion is, in mathematical terms, is is an equal sign. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. And check this out. Stubbornness is as idolatry and teraphim. What is teraphim? Teraphim is your your little lucky charms, your little charms that you wear around your neck and that you hang up in your house. Those are called household images, and we're going to get to that because that's another way to invite a curse into your home. It's having these images. Get rid of them carved images. 
Throw them away because you don't know the meaning behind them. Don't have things that you don't know the meaning of hanging up in your house. You don't know what they mean. They could be they they could be pictures. They could be another language. You find out what these things mean. You hanging stuff up and you don't know what they mean. You might be inviting some mess up in your crib. So, and the reason why these little images ain't cool is because of what they represent. What these images represent. What they represent could be something satanic. And you hanging it up. Ain't that cute? <laughs> yeah. We're going to see how cute it is when it destroys your household. And so that's what terrifying me. And we're going to get into that a little bit later. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Let me tell you something. Rebellion is the same thing as witchcraft. Witchcraft is the same thing as stubbornness and idolatry. They all are the same, and that brought the people of Israel into captivity. And you're in captivity because you practice this, or you come from a line of people that have practiced it, and you haven't uh, broken that curse. So I just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just giving you what the word says. I'm reading the exact word. This is not the gospel according to Bell. This is God's word. I'm reading the scriptures. You read them if you don't believe me, what I'm saying. But that's what the word says. It's All right? Rebellion. Huh? It's rebellion. Rebellion? Mm -hmm. Rebellion is simply... biblical sense. Okay. Re rebellion is anything opposite of what God says. Anything that's opposite of what God says is rebellion. Mm -hmm. When God says go east and you go west, you're in rebellion. When God says go 180 degrees to the right and you go 181 or, or, or 179, you're in rebellion. When you don't follow God's word exactly how he said it, you're in rebellion. And, you know, many of us fail at that, you know. And so what we do, we ask forgiveness. Ask God for forgiveness and get it out of your life. Don't keep doing the same thing over and over again. If you rebel, ask for forgiveness and he'll forgive you. Praise the Lord. When David sinned, he asked for forgiveness. God forgave him. And there's no record. That David committed those sins again. Now, he did pay for it. God took his butt to the woodshed. And God might take you or me to the woodshed. But hey, David was man enough to eat it. He ate it. He said, I was all wrong. He doesn't do what this culture does. He doesn't do what believers do nowadays. See, when believers make a mistake and, and get corrected, they, they, they like to explain it away. Or they like to make excuses. This is the most excusing generation I've ever seen in my life. Nobody wants to just say, you know what, I sinned and I'm wrong. Everybody wants to make an excuse. The excuse doesn't mean anything to God. It's the sin that, that, that you got to repent of. God, uh, David said, you know what, I sinned. When he committed adultery, adultery, and really that was child's play compared to what he did next. He committed murder. And, you know, he hid it for nine months thinking he could sacrifice to the Lord. The Lord wasn't speaking to him. He couldn't even sleep at night. Nathan the prophet finally came to him after nine months. He said, you are the man. And it broke him. And he wrote Psalm 51 because of that. And when he got it right with God, God said, you know what? You open the door for the enemies to attack you. He said, the door is open. And you know what? You're going to get taken to the woodshed. But, I, but I'm going to forgive you. And you're still going to be king. Because he had every, because the law said he should have been stoned. Hmm. David should have been stoned. But God says, since you ask for forgiveness, you're going to be king, but you're going to pay. You're going to pay because your kids are going to cut the food. One of them is going to sleep with all your wives in front of everybody. And one of them is going to attack your kingdom. You know, the other one is going to rape your daughter. You know, it was a mess. It was a mess. But you know what? The Bible says that David is a man after my own heart. That's what God says. And the Bible said he died in honor and riches. Mm -hmm. So you know what? He went through all that. He did all that. You know what? You might say, but man, I've done some serious sins. But you know what? God can forgive you and restore you. And you can still die with honor. Leave this earth with honor and be a person after God's own heart as well. You could be that. You could be that. Are you man or woman enough to just say, hey, look, Lord, I sinned. And whatever that punishment is, you may have to face it, however harsh it could be. And it could be harsh. And we don't like that. But... You know, 
it could happen, mm -hmm. you know. And then also the mercy of God, the mercy of God might say, you know what, I'm going to forgive you. But if you do it again, I'm going to open up the door and, and, and let everything and, and let the whole cemetery come out. I'm going to let all the bones fall out, out the closet. So God is a great God. He's a he's a he's an awesome God. We got to love him. All right. Number thir 13. I got a bunch of them, y'all. So we're going to pick this up next week. Number 13. Number 13. Wives, y'all get ready. Forgive me, but I'm getting ready to tell it like it is. Husbands who listen to their wives instead of listening to God. And all of us husbands, from time to time, we've made this mistake. Uh, listening to our wives instead of listening to God. Are we supposed to listen to our wives? Yes, we are. You are and I am to listen to my wife. And take exactly what she says. And a lot of times she's right. And listen to her. But sometimes God will tell you and I as husbands and leaders. No, this is what we're going to do. This is what I want you to do. That's when you have to be a leader. And sit down and say, sweetheart, this is what we're going to do. God said it. And you know what? The average wife is going to say, let's go. Mm -hmm. You're my leader. You follow God. I'm following you following God. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Now, some of them will get smart and say, you better be right, you know, but God would deal with them for being for, for acting like that, because that that's that's sinful, too. So but um, that's another thing. So, look, please understand, we got into this mess because uh, Adam listened to his wife Eve and partook of the fruit. And he wasn't supposed to do that. Eve was deceived, but Adam wasn't. So why would Adam do that? Well, I got my own ideas. OK, I think it was a, you know, like the song, it's a love thing. I think it was a love thing, you know, so I think it was a love thing. I think he was just enthralled. He was looking at Eve. He was like, look, I'm going to make something that's going to be special tonight for you. It's going to be special. Yeah, it was special because they got separated from God. They got separated from God and Adam knew better. Men, be leaders. Lead with love. Lead with example. Lead. You don't lead by telling people what to do. That's not leadership. You don't lead by being mean. That's cowardly. You lead by opening up your life and letting your wife see how you live. Let her see your weaknesses and your strengths. And let her anointing be a part of your anointing so you can walk together as one. All right? Because some of, uh, look, men, the bottom line, most of our wives are more anointed to us. More, more anointed than we are. They have special skills and abilities that we just ain't got. And you know what? They, uh, our wives with us, they eliminate our weaknesses and they help us. And they give us the strength that we need to live up on this, to live on this earth. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 20. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 20. So you wives that are trying to dominate your husbands, God won't bless you. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen either. Eventually, your husband is not going to honor you. So look, be careful, wives. Don't cause your husband's bed to be made somewhere else. Oh, oh. Because a lot of you do it. And then you get mad. Well, you, you would domineer. Let that man be a man. And if you're not willing to follow him, then leave him. Then leave him. Because when you go... Against the laws of God, you've opened up the door for sin to come into the household. You trying to dominate and you want everything you want. And the man can't say anything edgewise. The man can't do anything edgewise. Well, you just keep on. You're going you're gonna to find out his bed is somewhere else. All right. And that is the truth. All right. That is the bottom line. A lot of times, ladies, you run your man away from your household. You make the household, you know. <laughs> I was watching this show. <laughs> and uh, the guy, the, the host of the show, he said he had this friend who is an attorney who and the man makes like two hundred plus thousand dollars a year. And he said, man, I and, and, and his friend was telling him that he had to get him a part time job. And he said, man, what you doing with a part time job and you a lawyer? He said, man, I just got to get out the house. 
So guess what? Something's wrong. A, wa a, a wife should make the house so great that it is the first place that the husband wants to come to from work and it is the lab and, and it just should be an environment where he just don't want to leave because he just absolutely got to. He just absolutely have, have to. He don't want to leave, but he got to go. And then when he finished taking care of his business, he running back to the house. Now, see, if that's happening, you know, you're a good wife. You know you're a good wife. But if old boy is stopping here and there on the way home, he's stopping at Burger King, he at the club, you know, he's stopping at the church for special prayer, and he doing all this, let me tell you something, wife. You better be careful. You better be careful. And 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 you, you just better be careful. So let me just stop right there. And I'm going to read Genesis 3, 17 through 20. And Adam, and to Adam he said, because you have listened and given heed to the voice of your wife and have not eaten. Look. He said, this is what I'm going to do because you listened and gave heed to the voice mm. of your wife. Okay. And have eaten up and have eaten of the tree, which I commanded you. Saying, you shall not eat of it. The ground. He said, look, you shall not eat of it. He said, Adam, I told you. Your job was to tell Eve. Now you doing what Eve told you. Eve don't know what the heck she's doing. You know exactly what you're doing. Because in Timothy, in 1 Timothy, Paul by revelation of the Holy Spirit said, hey, she was deceived. Adam knew what he was doing. That's what makes it worse. That's why you really can't say nothing about Eve. You know, you mean talking about, well, Eve did. Yeah, Eve did it. But guess what? If Adam didn't do it, it wouldn't have been no thing. But Adam did it. And when Adam did it, that opened the door because the authority flows from God to the husband, to the mother, to the, uh, to the wife, and to the children. So God said, no, you're a responsible man. He said, because you've done this, he said, the ground is under a curse because of you. In sorrow and toil shall you eat of the fruits of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall bring it forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread until you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for dust you are and to dust you shall return look look um wives are not supposed to be mistreated in any kind of way but at the same time wives don't marry someone you're not willing to follow don't marry someone you're not willing to follow it's just as simple as that and you might say, yeah, but he messing up. So what he messing up? So what? He messing up. You pray. You let him know what's going down, how you feel. And God will work on him. And he'll do what's right if he's a good husband. He's a good husband. But you trying to push the envelope, you're going to push the envelope to another mailbox. That's what you're going to do. So look, stay in your lane so that you can be honored by God. Because when you walk in your lane, God automatically protects you. And guess what? When you walk in your lane and the man is messing up, God makes it clear. Hey, look, I ain't going to answer your prayers until you start treating your wife right. So God has built in protections for the wife. You just can't do what you want to as a husband. Can't do that. You're accountable to God and you're accountable to your wife. And the wife is accountable to the husband as well. So we're going to stop right there. We're going to pick up next week. So let me see how many more do I have. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have ten more points. I think I can squeeze in one more. I'll squeeze in one more real quick. All right, can you bear with me a few minutes? If not, hey, God bless you. Tell Pookie and them I said, hey, and we're going to keep on going here. One more point. All right, number 14, people who are proud. Proud people invoke a curse. You want to know why? Because they worship themselves <laughs> instead of God. The Bible in Psalm chapter 119 verse 21 says, You rebuke the proud and arrogant, the accursed ones, who err and wander from your commandments. The Bible says that a proud person is an accursed person. A person who is a curse. If they are a walking curse. Do not befriend proud people. Proud people God hates. 
The Bible says he gives he uh he he gives grace to the humble. He ignores the proud and he gives grace to the humble. All right. So I'm gonna just look at that. I'm sorry. God rebukes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So when you are proud or when a person is walking in pride, then idolatry basically is in their life. All right. When you see a narcissistic, proud person, really a narcissist is the equivalent of a, of, of a, uh, a proud person. I would say that, but it's a little bit more than that. But um, I'll just, you know, right now that a narcissistic person is a person who worships himself or herself. And they don't mind sacrificing spouse, friends, family, children, co-workers. They'll sacrifice anybody in order to get what they want. They'll tell on you. They'll lie on you. They'll go behind your back. They'll even do it to your face, some of them, in order for them to get what they want. Look, if you are a proud person, uh, you're walking in the spirit of Leviathan. Leviathan is a proud spirit. In fact, it's described as a large water beast in the book of Job. And Job talks about Leviathan, how his skin, how its skin is extremely tough and it's hard for anyone to pierce the proud. And the reason being is because a proud person only listens to him or herself. So God says, look, don't walk in pride. When you walk in pride, you replace God with yourself and you become your own God. That means God does not have to take care of you or protect you. You're up to your own devices. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, look, God bless you. We're going to pick up uh, at the next point next week. And uh, I just pray that it's been um, a blessing to you. We're doing Bible study. We're not doing no preaching right now. I want you to get these scriptures. I want you to think about them. And if these are things that you find yourself walking in or could be a pattern in your family's life, rebuke them in the name of Jesus. All you have to do is just simply ask God to forgive you and to forgive the sins of your ancestors. And that curse will be broken in your life and it will not pass down to your children's and children's children onto the fourth generation. And so I'm all about setting up a legacy for the next generation now that I know what I know. And so um, we don't want the enemy involved in our legacy. Praise the Lord. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time of Bible study. I thank you for all the listeners that came on. Um, I pray that they've been blessed by this word. And I pray, Father, that they take this word, that they study it, pray it out, walk it out and implement it in their lives as well. And so, Father, lift them up. Give them strength, Father. Thank you for answering their prayers. I thank you for protecting them. I thank you for blessing them, Lord. But I pray, Father, that they also walk in your knowledge and walk in understanding and wisdom as well. So, Father, I just declare that they're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Your favor, the favor of God, richly dwells in them and surrounds their lives. And I just declare in accordance to Isaiah, in accordance to Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, no weapon formed against them shall prosper, and every tongue that rises up against them in judgment shall be condemned. And this is my prayer to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, look, God bless you. We will see you next week, if the Lord willing. We're going to continue on what can bring a curse into your life or causes for curses. Because remember, a, call, a curse does not come unless... There is a cause. All right. So we're going to see you next week. And remember, the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. But Jesus came that you may have life and have it more abundantly, abundant, abundantly, Zoe life filled to the full and overflowing a life that's full of quality and quantity at the same time. All right. God bless you, dear brothers and sisters. And we'll see you next time. Take care.